season of Christmas. The leave taking of Christmas is tomorrow when we begin making our way towards the Theophany. And so we have the circumcision of Christ on Tuesday as well as the feast of St. Basil. So since we're still in Christmas, what I'd like to do is go back to my sermon last Sunday. Um, in case there may have been some confusion or maybe, maybe it was um, difficult to, to understand what, uh, what I was trying to say in that sermon. Uh, it, it, so, if you will turn in your, in your Bibles to the uh, first chapter of Matthew, and we'll go, we'll look at the genealogy. But now I want to look at the genealogy. We're not, we've not quite left Ephesians. And so I'd like to look at the genealogy in the light of, um, in particular, of Ephesians chapter 2, I believe it's verse 2, where it talks about the, the energy that is of the, of the dark power of the air, the ruler of the air that is working in the children of disobedience, in contrast to chapter 3, verse 20, uh, now, uh, to, to him who, is, who has the power, who, who is able to do all things um, beyond whatsoever we might ask or think, according to the power that is working in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ for all, in, uh, to all the ages and ages. So, this is verse 320. We have two energies that are working in us. Two energies working in the world. There's the energy that is working according to the, what's called the dark energy. That's working according to the ruler of the air, which is the, which is the, is the evil one, Satan. And then there's the energy of light. Let's call this the divine energy. Let's call this of evil. These two energies actually are going to be very visible in the gospel this morning. So in terms of the gospel this morning, we have the energy of Herod. And here we have the energy of the Lord. So, but that will be for today. That will be this afternoon, this this, this morning at the sermon. <clears throat> so, the genealogy of, of, of Saint Matthew. How many would you say? How many of you, perhaps, when you look at the, when you read the genealogy of Saint Matthew? You kind of zone out. Um, and you assume that um, it is to be taken, um, how would you say, uh, well, literally, if, uh, you know, just as it is. But there are certain indications, and this is what I was wanting to point out in the sermon last Sunday, um, that should alert us that you can't take this genealogy of Matthew at face value. You can't take it just as it is. There, there are, are at least two indications that uh, if we're paying attention, should jar us, unsettle us. The first actually comes from the very first uh, verse. The book of the Genesis or of the origin of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Um, Genesis, the, you know, that's, uh, the, that has to do with, with uh, descendants, origins in terms of one's family. So the family origin, the family tree of Jesus Christ, 
son of David, son of Abraham. But then you go to a verse, actually you go beyond the genealogy, and you get into the story of Jesus' genesis, his birth. Picking up at verse 18. Um, and it says that before she, Mary and Joseph came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, being a righteous man, and not wishing to make her, up, you know, not wishing to embarrass her, counseled secretly to divorce her. But while he was ruminating over these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is born in her is of the Holy Spirit. So there's the first, um, you know, how would, would you call it, um, puzzle, first riddle. He's the son of, Ab of David and Abraham, but then we go on, and as we read the story, we discover that, well, technically, he's not the son of David and Abraham. I mean, you know, he's not. He was not sired by David or Abraham or any of them in, the, in that genealogy. He was sired by God in the Holy Spirit. So we already now have this first indication that, we're, that this genealogy, that, 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 that Jesus, is, that the genealogy is, is about Jesus Christ, who is... A theological mystery. It's a theological mystery. And that this genealogy then that St. Matthew is setting before us is, it's historical. There's no question. It is historical. But it's theological. That St. Matthew is giving to us the theological mystery. He's giving us to us See, he's giving us to, to us the theological origin of Jesus. So we have this Genesis in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, which shows him the son of Abraham and David. And then we have this Genesis that picks up at verse 18. Now the birth of the Genesis or the birth of Jesus Christ was in this manner, in which he is the son of of God the Father in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's given, moreover, in this. I mean, this, it says that he's sired by the Holy Spirit, but this is not like any other um, barrenness that was, um, that was healed by, by God. Um, he will be, he will be, uh, she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, which in Hebrew is Joshua, the same name, and in Hebrew it means the Lord, that's the je part, um, saves. That is the sus part. And this is ya ho. Yahushua, uh, Yahweh, this is the short for Yahweh, the Savior. His name shall be Jesus. That's why the angel continues, his name is Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. From their sins. Well, who's the one that saves from sins, you see? Is God. Man doesn't save us from our sins. And so right away we have this, this revelation that this child in Mary's womb, who is not sired by David, Abraham, not even by Joseph, sired by the Holy Spirit, is himself God because he's going to be forgiving people. He's going, he forgives sins. So that's the first indication. The first jarring point. The second jarring point is in the genealogy itself. This is what I was 
referring to it this, in the sermon last Sunday. We come to Mary. We have the genealogy that takes us from Abraham in verse 2 up to Joseph in verse 16. And if you look at the formulas, you'll notice that the formula is the same all the way through. Abraham begat or sired Isaac, and Isaac sired Jacob, Jacob sired Judah and his brothers, da 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 And David sired Solomon from the wife of Uriah. Well, you know who that is, right? Yeah, yeah Bathsheba. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, so forth and so on, until we get to Joseph. Uh, verse 16, And Jacob begat, or sired, Joseph. And there the formulary stops. Jacob begat Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And from Mary was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. The Christ also is a, is a name for king. It's what you call the king. The Christ is the king. So the son of David, the Christ, the king, the anointed one. But he's not born, you know, he's not sired by any in that, in that line. He's, he's, That's what's so scary. Yeah, exactly. So, it's, so Mary comes in, bang, out of nowhere. Now, we know, the church knows, and I think the church knows from the beginning, uh, that Mary's parents were Joachim and Anna. The first uh, record that we have of Mary's uh, conception really is uh, in the so-called Protoevangelium of James, which was written down in the, uh, in the middle of the second century. But uh, it was written down. That doesn't mean that it was composed in the middle of the second century. It was a writing down of an oral tradition that had been handed down over the generations. Um, there's that. <clears throat> but also, one is struck by how the, the birth of Mary, her conception and her birth, um, is thoroughly prophetic. I mean, every, every aspect of her birth and conception and of her entrance into the temple is drawn from the Psalms or some, element, some, some passage of the prophet. Um, nothing in her story is extraneous you know, from the Old Testament. So that, personally, I'm led to believe that, um, contrary to what some scholars, Orthodox scholars even, have conceded, that this is a legend, I personally am not convinced that it's a legend. I'm of the opinion that it is very likely, quote unquote, fact. That, um, and so we know who her parents were. And yet, St. Matthew obviously is not interested in giving to us the, 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 the genealogy in the flesh of Mary. He's wanting to give to us her theological significance as the virgin mother of this child, Jesus Christ, who is sired by the Holy Spirit and who is himself God, as is clear from the name that's given to him and as is clear as to, from what is said about what he will do. Only God forgives sins. Um, so, can you see then that, that, that the way that, that Matthew's genealogy is presenting Mary, he presents her as just, bang, out of nowhere. Where did she come from? And he doesn't say where she came from. She just appears. This <laughs> mysterious, this mysterious figure this virgin. Um, St. Matthew quotes in verse 23, he quotes from Isaiah, Behold, the virgin will conceive, and she will bear a son, 
and you will call, they will call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. So um, this is the virgin that was prophesied by Isaiah. That's who she is. That's where she comes from. She's the virgin. So what then is her theological significance? And here, it's at this point that, that for me, as I, as, I, as I go from here, and you know, I'm looking, I'm looking, trying to figure out, okay, well, where do we go from here? Here's Mary. Where does she come from? St. Matthew doesn't say. And it seems that he says it intentionally. Um, he, she, where, where do we go? So, um, I don't know, you have the advantage, you heard the sermon last Sunday, to the degree that you remember it, to the degree that you're paying attention. Um, what, right now, as we're stuck in this place, where did Mary come from? Where does your mind go? Anywhere? As you're trying to solve the riddle of the Blessed Virgin, where does she come from? Why, what, what's the meaning of this, that she just appears from nowhere? You're stuck. We're stuck. Well, this is where my mind went. My mind immediately went to the feast of her entry into the temple, where she is received at the age of three by the priest at that time, Zacharias. Zacharias takes her into his arms, and he says to her, Strange! is the manner of your birth, strange is the manner of your growing, strange and contrary to all expectation is everything about you, O virgin maiden. To me that fits to a T uh, what St. Matthew's genealogy is presenting, with, <coughs> presenting us with. This is a strange thing. Strange is the manner of your conception, Strange is the manner of your growing. Strange is everything about you. And, and actually the word in the Greek is, para, is paradoxa, which can be translated as paradoxical or even you know, enigmatic, um, a kind of a riddle. Everything about you is a riddle. There's this other, another verse from the same feast where again, uh, the, the, the strangeness, the mysterious strangeness of the virgin is presented when we when the when the church sings um, three years old in the flesh but many years old in the spirit um, so in all of these things um, the church is presenting to us with saint matthew um, the the virgin as you know the virgin mary not as an ordinary woman you know, as we, as we find in some parts of so-called Christendom, where she's just this, and she's presented as this, you know, as this uh, kind of lowly, um, humble, uh, I don't know, hand, you know, a scrub, scrub girl or something, you know, a, a, a hand, a house, household, house servant. I don't know. Um, and so she, she's chosen as the mother of God, or uh, the mother of Jesus, and then she's, then, then, the, then, then they forget her. Um, as a side, I would suggest that the only way that you can, that you can get away with presenting Mary as this kind of ordinary household, you know, servant, or as this ordinary uh, farm girl or whatever, you know, you, you know what I'm trying to say. The only way you can get away with that is if you think or teach or believe that, that Jesus, her son, is an ordinary man. And if you want to say he's the son of God, well, the way that the, La that the West, generally speaking, gets around that, they don't want to, they don't mean to, but their theological understanding, from what I've studied, just is not up to par. And they can't get past it. So that they leave, and I've heard even the preachers and the, the, the church leaders, you know, talk like this, that Jesus is joined to God. So he's his own independent subject. He is, he is, he is a man who is joined to God the Word. So that 
Jesus is just an ordinary man and he's extraordinary only in the closeness of his relationship to God, the Word. Well, that's the heresy of Nestorianism. And um, that's my charge to the Latin West, that they are crypto-Nestorians. They don't want to be, as I said. They, don't, they, they try not to be. But I mean, and I, the text that I've read, you know, when they're talking theologically, they can say that Jesus is God the Word just fine. But when they go over here and they start talking about his virgin birth, they start talking about uh, the cross, now is when things start to break down in their theology. Now they start, even Augustine, this is where I found it was in Augustine. Over here he sounds quite orthodox, but when he's over here he's talking especially about uh, you know, certain aspects of the Savior's uh, life. His, his theology breaks down, and now you, you read him and it sounds like he's treating Jesus as, as, as a separate individual from God the Word. And my contention is that that's the only way that you can treat the Virgin Mary like many so-called Christians treat her. Um, and to me also, that is an evidence, an indication that your Christology, your understanding of Christ is defective, if not heretical. But if you understand that the one who was born, who was conceived in her womb, is himself God the Word, and as you heard it at our Christmas texts, the uncontainable one is contained in the womb. The timeless one becomes subject to time. Um, the beautiful Tukuntakian of St. Romanos. Today, um, the virgin gives birth to the transcendent one. And the earth offers a cave to the unapproachable one. Um, for to us, the pre-eternal God is born as a little child. Well, if the one who was born in the Virgin Mary, of the Virgin Mary, is God the Son, how can you treat her as an ordinary woman? It doesn't make sense, does it? So you're going to exalt her. You're going to honor her. This is the woman who gave birth to God and brought him into the flesh. You see. So this is where my mind goes first, is in, in contemplating the strangeness of the Virgin as she is presented to us in the genealogy of St. Matthew. It, it just, it, it's the way that the church puts, it hides things. It's almost like a veil to over, I mean, it's almost like that part is hidden. In tell you the church, you may understand it, but the reason that they even have this genealogy is why would they even stick it in there. Well, isn't if people are going to invite you, they come away with this idea that... Well, now, isn't it interesting, Don, can you say that it's hidden, and yet it's right in front of us? I mean, come on now. Yeah, and, yeah. but people don't get over the surface. It's so yeah. shallow. It's how many times have we read... Yeah. How many times have we read this, and we've missed it completely? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know... So the indications are right there. They're right in front of us. Um, so, uh, so it's like again, you know, it takes me to the, the the word of the prophet. Having eyes, they do not see; having ears, they do not hear. Uh, they have a throat, they have a mouth, but they make no sound. They have hands, but they don't move. They have feet, but they don't walk. Well, what the prophet is describing is the idol, and those who make them are just like them. So they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. In other words, they're blind to death. They're basically spiritual corpses, which takes us back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, what? Uh, that, that uh, you were dead in your sins and in your trespasses. In other words, para, para ptoma. You became those who were lying alongside, beside a corpse. So anyway, this is the first point that, this is, where, this is the first place that my mind goes. Um, in, 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 in trying to solve the riddle of Mary's strangeness. Um, it goes to the, the feasts of the Theotokos that are, that, we, that are in the church. But now as I'm contemplating this, um, you know, strange is the manner of your birth, strange is the manner of your growing, strange and contrary to all expectation is everything about you, most blessed maiden, um, three years old in the flesh, many years old in the spirit. Um, you know, where did you come from? Who are you? So as I'm contemplating that, um, my mind immediately goes 
to, I don't, I think it's Psalm, I, I want to say Psalm 17, but I don't think that's what it is, uh, where, where, where the psalmist cries out to, to the Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him? We are a mystery. Um, and then my mind goes to um, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Let us make man in our own image. We are made in the image and in the likeness of God. So how are you going to explain us? We are strange. Our origin is strange. Um, because, you know, beyond the, the mystery of our own physical birth, birth from our mom and dad, there is the mystery of just who we are. Where, where, in fact, where did we come from? Beyond our physical birth, there is a theological, there's a spiritual mystery about us. We are made in the image and likeness of God. That's where we came from. And then you have Luke's genealogy, which is in chapter 3, if you want to take a look at that. You have Luke's genealogy where he traces um, the line, again, apparently of Joseph. But he's, so Matthew's genealogy leads up to Joseph. Luke's genealogy, starting with verse... Okay, verse chapter 3, uh, verse 23, starts with Joseph and goes back past Abraham all the way to Adam. But now let's see here. It says, so where it was for St. Matthew's genealogy, uh, Joseph comes at the climax of the genealogy. And then the climax is kind of, where'd it go? Just so, you know, the, the genealogy disappears. That's, that's, I, love gene, I love Matthew's genealogy. He goes through all this trouble to list all the generations that lead up to Joseph. And then as far as, in effect, that genealogy just disappears. It's, it's, you know, what's the point of, bring, of doing the genealogy anyway? Because it brought us to Joseph where it stopped and then connected us to Mary because Joseph married Mary. He, she was his betrothed. And... Uh, the Christ child is married, is born from her, not from Joseph, from her. So what's the point of this genealogy? What is the, the, the first start of that? It says... It In Matthew? Be, yeah, the one you just... Jesus, uh, say the Genesis, uh, the book of the Genesis, or the origin of Jesus Christ, son of Abraham, son of David. <coughs> or is it the other way? Son of David, son no, of Abraham. No, still have Christ in there. Genealogy. genealogy, yes. Yeah. Son of Abraham, and that okay, that was my first point that I was pointing yeah, you right, on. Exactly. He has he he says that he's 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 the of the genealogy of Abraham and David, but then we go to verse twenty three and bang, where's Abraham and David? There, um, he is he is he is said to be the son. As was, supposed. As was but no, because verse twenty three, yeah. the one that is born of her or that is conceived in her womb is is sired by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God the Father. Now that takes me to John. Just think about it. That takes me to John. Where Jesus says to the Jews, Before Abraham was, I am. So it's like G Matthew's genealogy is saying this, is giving the same theology that John is giving in this word of Jesus to the Pharisees. Before Abraham was, I am. There you find it in Matthew's genealogy. Here's Abraham. So Jesus According to that, comes from the loins of Abraham until we get to Mary and now bang, we, no, he's the son of God. So before Abraham was, before Abraham was originated, uh, Jesus was as the son of God. Okay, but now we go to Luke's genealogy and, uh, and, and uh, now Jesus, uh, when he began, he, he began, this is after his, after his uh, baptism, he comes up from the waters. And I, I, there's got to be some reason uh, why Luke saves Jesus' genealogy to uh, after the baptism, whereas Matthew gives his genealogy at the very beginning. And I'm wondering if it has to do with the fact that the baptism is the coronation, uh, showing that Jesus is the king. And maybe it was a custom that when a king was crowned, 
I have no I'm just wild speculation. I'm wondering if it was a tradition or the custom that when the king was crowned, you went through his, his, his pedigree, his genealogy, to show why he was legitimately the king. Especially if he was a usurper, perhaps. All the more reason to show why he, was, why he, he deserved to be the king from his pedigree. I don't know. But it says, uh, and Jesus, when he began, was about 30 years, being the son, as it was supposed, of Joseph of Eli. So, okay, already, Jesus' genealogy is thrown somewhat into, into question. Um, it's a mystery. But the point that I want to draw out here is that we, find, we follow um, Luke's genealogy from Joseph goes all the way to verse 38 where we read, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. The son of God. So what I'm driving at is, who are we? So we're created in the image and the likeness of God. That's, that is our origin that is even deeper than our origin from mom and dad. And here we have man as a race. We are all, mankind in Adam is the son of God. So that my genealogy, my origin, if I can trace it all the way back to Adam, in Adam, my origin, if it were, if you were, it opens onto God. So that deep within my soul, deep within my essence, I originate in God. I'm the son of God. I'm created in his image and in his likeness. So strange is Mary. Strange is her birth. Strange and marvelous is everything about her. Well, what I see now is that, in fact, Mary is simply, you know, the mystery of Mary is simply, quote unquote, simply presenting to us the mystery of our own, of, our, of ourselves. Because Mary is a human being like we are. She's the son of man like we are. And just like her, we too are strange and marvelous in our origin, our ultimate origin, because we originate in God. All right, so... That's where my reflections lead me so far. So now what we've seen is that, um, um, that, that, that Mary um, is, um, is this strange figure. She comes from out of nowhere as though she comes from outside the genealogy of man. Uh, she just comes from, any, from somewhere. So, in that respect, we're seeing something about the mystery of ourselves. We, too, come from, ultimately, outside our human genealogy. We, too, originate outside of the flesh. Um, we've talked before in this class, we've talked about the, the logi. I know the, 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 the or let's say, call it the names. That each one of us has a name that is known only to God and that he has known from all eternity. So, in a manner of speaking, we existed before we existed. Um, it doesn't mean that we're eternal, pre-eternal like God is. This again, this is, this, is, this is, we're trying to speak a theological mystery here about ourselves. And so here's where language begins to break down. Um, we each one, none of us just kind of happened, you know, popped out of, out of the blue from out of nowhere. Uh, as, as he says to Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were in the womb, I knew you. And there's that formula in several places, places in, in the scripture. Each one of us has a name. This is our true identity. And our true identity is to be found not in ourselves, is to be found in God. So this is one thing, one teaching that... Um, comes out of this genealogy as you reflect upon, um, you know, <laughs> the strangeness of the genealogy. It's a strange genealogy because it ends with Joseph and then bang, with Mary. Where does she come from? 
So as I'm contemplating that, this is what, ha this is what has led me in my contemplations. All right, well, I don't know if there was a, a direct link from, from what I've just been describing to Melchizedek, or if uh, just, just the whole thing suggests Melchizedek to me. Except that, if you recall, at the um, vigil on Christmas Eve, I believe it was, where we, I think it was Christmas Eve afternoon, and we read from the Old Testament passages. One of the Old Testament passages we read from, I believe, was Genesis chapter 13, and that's where we read about Melchizedek and Abraham coming out to give tithes to, it, to Melchizedek. Um, the Prince of Peace, the Priest of God, it says. Um, I didn't take the time to find this for sure, but it's somewhere there, verse 13, or chapter, or chapter 13 or so, maybe not chapter 13, no, here it is, I just found it, chapter 14, uh, chapter 14, Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem brought forth loaves and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God who made heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God who delivered thine enemies into thy power. Now, where else do we even come across Melchizedek? I don't think we hear about Melchizedek again until we come into the New Testament. Hebrews. So he, um, and I'm thinking that based on what we read in Hebrews, it sounds like... Um, Melchizedek was a big deal in the early church. The theology of Melchizedek was a big deal. I think it is chapter 7. The priestly order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, a priest of the Most High God, uh, the one who met, that, that Abraham uh, met, and whatever, I, mean, I can't read the Greek now, and blessed him. He was something of the um, to whom Abraham gave a portion, a tenth of a portion of all that he had, of all of his goods. Um, some, yeah, and it goes on in verse 3. Um, this Melchizedek, he was without father, he was without mother, without genealogy. I think this is what actually made me think of Melchizedek as I was contemplating uh, the genealogy, where Mary just appears from out of nowhere, without father, without mother, without a genealogy, in Matthew's genealogy. So, um, you know, she's, she's like Melchizedek. But she's not Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Jesus Christ is Melchizedek. Or I'd say he's, Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ. I think it's fuzzy. Was, was Melchizedek Christ? Pre-incarnate Christ? Or... Was he just some mysterious figure that um, was likened to Jesus Christ and taken as an icon, an, a prophetic icon of Jesus Christ? We should ask Bishop Melchizedek. I'll bet he studied the matter. Maybe he could give us some, some interesting answers. But um, does it make sense to you? I mean, it, you know, as I'm thinking about this, okay, well, of course. If the one that she gives birth to is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, what does that make her? If Melchizedek is a priest, he's got to have a temple, doesn't he? So what does that make the Virgin Mary? The temple. She is the temple of Melchizedek. She's the mother of Melchizedek. So it makes sense that she, as the temple, the living temple of Jesus, the one after the order of Melchizedek, she would be the temple after the order of the temple of Melchizedek. So that like Melchizedek's temple, which presumably, or his mother, you know, his mother that he doesn't have, <laughs> you know, without father, without mother. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing, without father, without mother, uh, without genealogy. Um, this is the mystery of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and of his mother, the Virgin Mary, the temple of this Melchizedek. But now, 
Now that would take us, I believe, I did not bother to verify this, I think it is verse 9, or excuse me, chapter 9, um, chapter 9, uh, verse 11 in Hebrews. Um, now Christ has become uh, becoming the, the, the uh, Christ, being the having become the high priest of the good things that were yet to come, that were coming to be, um, through the greater and more perfect temple, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. I just want to point something out to you here. Um, this it says this greater and more perfect temple. The word here is skini, and it means tent, and it's the word that is used for the tabernacle of Moses. When he built the, the tabernacle according to God's directions, again, according to God's instructions, he didn't just, just didn't just build the temple you know, out of his head. He was directed, he was given the pattern, he was given the design of how to build the temple from God himself. That the word that is used for the tabernacle that he builds is this word, skinny. Now, in John chapter 1, verse 14, I think it is, it says, The word became flesh. And then it goes on to say, as it is translated of thus, in into English, and the and and the word, I say the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. But guess what? Guess what that word for dwelt is? I think it's enskinosis. It's taken from this word. Let's just verify it. I think it's enskinosis. So if you wanted to give a more theological interpretation of chapter 1, verse 14, yes, eskinosin. The word is. It's amazing. It, okay, this is the noun. The noun here is taken and, and turned into a verb. Eskinosis, but you see the root. There it is. So if you wanted to take the, um, give a more theological, give, an, give a translation that is more theologically accurate and descriptive, you would have, to, I, would, I would translate it as, and the word became flesh and pitched his tent or pitched his, the, the temple of his, of his body among us. Why can we say the temple of his body? Number one, the word skini, eskinosis, he became incarnate, is built off of this word, this Old Testament prophetic word for the tent, the tabernacle. But secondly, John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, this is when he um, overthrows the money changers uh, in the temple. And they challenge him. And he says in verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then it goes on in verse 21. And he was talking about the temple of his body. Now this both complicates things, but also opens them up to a huge vision. Because the word that is used in John chapter 1, 19 is not skinny. It's na naos. It's naos. Now, what's going on here? In the Old Testament, there are two temples. The one is the temple of Moses. That's the moving temple. The one that's built of, out of skins, made out of skins. It's a tent temple. And then there was the temple that was built by Solomon. And that was the stone temple. The fixed temple. And this is the word for that kind of temple. So. So. Um, destroy this temple. They, and so he's, he's in, being intentionally um, a, a riddle. He's, he's throwing them a riddle intentionally. Making them think that he's talking about uh, Solomon's temple or you know, whatever. They're standing there in front of them. The stone, this temple built out of stone. All right, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Well, so we've got, if, if he's using this word, naos, 
rather than skinny, the tabernacle, the moving tabernacle, what, he, what you draw from that is what? That, when he, that in his death, he becomes mystically what? Does he, he becomes of the temple. What is he of the temple? He, the Christ is the blank of the temple. Cornerstone. The cornerstone. So he becomes the cornerstone of, it's not of a skinny anymore. It's not a moving temple anymore. The moving temple was Jesus' incarnate body. And he's moving throughout Galilee like he's on an exodus. You know, he's gathering, gathering Israel through his, his peregrinations, his, his exodus throughout, throughout Galilee and Palestine. So when he, um, when he is crucified on the cross, um, the, ta the, the moving temple of his skin is destroyed. And in its place comes the immovable temple of stone which is his body, it's immovable, and this becomes the cornerstone of the real temple of Solomon. The real temple of Solomon, uh, built out of the stone, or built, on, built out of the stone of the word of God that is rooted in the stone, which is the word of God. Okay, so going back to the Virgin Mary, she is, she is then, is, she then is the temple of this Melchizedek, um, from whom comes forth, um, you know, the king uh, of Israel, uh, the God of Israel, uh, the Christ, his coming forth from the womb of the virgin, um, his temple, is given to us in Ezekiel chapter 47. You remember, it talks about the east gate, and from the east gate, which will remain closed, referring to the virginal birth, from the east gate comes forth this mighty river that gets deeper as it goes. It goes all the way to Galilee, it says. But she then is that temple that Ezekiel is seeing in his vision, from whom the Christ comes forth as this mighty river. In other words, he comes forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, the living waters of Christ. Um, so all of so so I mean all of this, you know, all of this is, is contained in, in, in this very simple genealogy of St. Matthew but that by its, to use Dan's words, screwiness opens us onto a riddle that can be, that is solved in the church. We can't, I, I couldn't solve, I didn't solve this just by thinking about it. How am I solving it? I'm going to this passage in scripture. I'm going to this verse of the church going to this hymn of the church. I'm putting it all together. I'm drawing it all together and bearing it upon this riddle. And what I'm seeing is that the virgin Theotokos, she is the temple made without hands. How so? She's the temple that is not of this world, the, the world that's, that, the same, uh, that the Hebrews is talking about. How so? She's virgin. She's virgin. She, her, you know, it, it's God who sired this, this Lord in her. No man. God sired this Lord in her. Um, and so she is, the, she is the living temple of this, of this priest after the order of Melchizedek. She is, she is the one from whom, she is the moving temple, if you will, from which the stone temple uh, is made. And so what you see then is that um, the temple that the Old Testament is centered on, the Old Testament is centered on the temple and the God who was in that temple. But in the Old Testament, that temple that the Old Testament is centered on is built by man. And it's either built out of skins or it's built out of stones taken from the earth. But that we now see, you know, contemplating the riddle in St. Matthew's genealogy, we now see that that temple, in fact, was a type. It was an icon of the virgin. She is the living temple not made with hands. And so what we see is that the temple of God is not a thing, it's not a what. The temple of God is the person of the virgin. It's a person, it's, got, it's, 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 it's motherly, it's, 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 it's God's mother. She is God's mother. So this puts a completely different, gives a completely different understanding to, you know, to, to, the, to the word of the prophets and to the word of the scripture, that it's, and even to the understanding of salvation. The salvation, you know, it's, it's personal. It, 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 it's, 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 it's being restored into communion and becoming one with God, not through a message, but through God himself, the person of God himself. 
So what we see in this genealogy of St. Matthew, he's taking us from Abraham and David. So it's like he's taking us from the temple of the Old, temp of the Old Testament and he's brought us to the temple of the New Testament, which is the Virgin Mary. And what I see in this is that he is indicating that the worship of the Old Testament, you know, the Levitical, uh, the, the law of the Old Testament, it's not so much that it's been destroyed, but rather that law has been taken up into, if you will, the womb of the Virgin, because Christ is the law. Christ is the law of Moses. And so the law of Moses is taken up into the womb of the Virgin, and it becomes incarnate in the mystery of her son, Jesus Christ. And so now that all that worship has been moved over into the mystery of the Virgin, into the mystery of the, of the mother, the mother of God. And now those who worship God in spirit and in truth, worship him in the temple of his mother. You, know, I mean, you begin to see, we cannot approach Christ outside of his temple outside the Theopokos. When you approach Christ, you approach him in his holy temple, the Theotokos. This gives another, you know, explanation as to why the Theotokos is so big, so critical, so important in the faith and in salvation. Christ is in his holy temple. He's in his Holy Mother. There is no salvation outside of the Theotokos. Because Christ is in the Theotokos. And if God calls you outside of the Theotokos, I would dare say that if it is in fact God who's calling you, he's going to call you to his Christ who is in his Holy Temple of the Theotokos. Because in the Holy Temple of the Theotokos, where her son is sitting enthroned, what do we, you know, among many, many, many other things, we enter into the mystery of God and his salvation, which is expressed and which is experienced in the ineffable, inexpressible tenderness of the love for, of, her, of the mother for her son and of the son for his mother. That's what it is in the church. It's not a set of rules and regulations. It's, it's this warm tenderness, this love, of the mother for her son and the son for his mother that we enter into. And it's this love that washes over us, that we eat and drink, that we absorb into ourselves to the degree that we give ourselves to it. This is the love that heals us, heals our brokenness, heals our loneliness, um, heals our death. This is what heals us and saves us. And this is why we love the church, because the church loves us. All right, well, that's a good ending, so <laughs> you need to get up.